Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is David Holmgren. He's an Australian environmental designer, ecological educator, and writer. He's best known as one of the co-originators of the permaculture concept with Bill Mollison. Um, so first off, thank you for your work in the world, and second, thank you for being on the program. Good to be here. So what is permaculture? Yeah, I suppose permaculture means different things to different people. The the concept and people's use of it has evolved a lot over the 40 years since uh, Permaculture One was published in 1978. Uh, I describe it as a design system for sustainable living and sustainable land use. Uh, so in that sense, it's concerned with both the production side of the equation, uh, how we get our uh, basic needs from a working relationship with nature, primarily through agriculture, um, and uh, also uh, how we use those resources through the ways we live. So uh, I think, you know, most people associate it with gardening and agriculture, uh, but it's also... Uh, concerned with architecture, how we build and organise our settlements. And so in that sense, you know, for a lot of people, it's you know, a bit of a theory of everything. Uh, but it works from a basis that uh, the limits to growth are real, uh, that was clearly known a long time ago, and that the future for humanity might be one of environmental constraints which are very clear that will require a complete redesign of the way uh, human society is organised. And in a practical sense, permaculture starts with the individual, the household, uh, the land where people are and what they can do to change that from the bottom up by modelling, by redesign of the most basic things that they have control over. So let's... I love everything you're saying, and it also, like you said, is a, is a theory of everything. So can you can you contrast... Perma, what is permaculture in contrast to, then? Like, what is what is this... Well, two questions. One is, what is it in contrast to explicitly, and the other is, um, what does this mean? And I recognize that it will mean a different thing in where I'm living, where it's raining like crazy right now in a temperate California redwood rainforest, where it would mean something different there. But So two things. What is this in contrast to, and two, what can you give some examples of what this might mean on the ground? Yeah, so permaculture started in questioning the the basic way that humans get their needs, and that is primarily through agriculture and other forms of land use, forestry, um, uh, fishing, um, uh, all of the different ways of, of getting our needs from nature. And then the additional uh, extraction of non-renewable resources that gave us uh, the Industrial Revolution and transformed all of those other more traditional ways of uh, getting our needs. And in recognising the limits of fossil fuels, um, both the limits of impacts on the environment, uh, which is primarily expressed through climate change, and of resource depletion, uh, of which peak oil is uh, emblematic, then that redesign would require that we look very closely at agriculture uh, because agriculture was problematic for industrialisation but it became much more problematic with industrialisation. And at the simplest level, um, there were two elements that permaculture in the beginning started with, was the tendency for agriculture to become monoculture and that it needed to again become polycultural, diverse 
mixed rather than vast areas of one one crop. The second issue was the over-dependence of agriculture on annual plants to provide for our needs, primarily through grains and um, other highly bred annual plants, that that was an unbalanced ecosystem and we needed a greater use of perennial plants, especially trees. So this idea of redesign of, of that basic way that humans provide needs led to a strong focus on the huge biological potential of tree crops in the world that was not being uh, used and a strong focus on how do you uh, put together systems where there's, rather than the imagined deficiencies of having monoculture of one large patch of things, that you're actually uh, got a diversity together and where rather than what producing for one market, you are producing for human needs. So that suggests a shift from trying to do everything in the monetary economy to trying to do more things back in the household and community non-monetary economies, providing for needs on site. So in a practical sense, that often meant can we grow more of our own food ourselves in simple, organic, uh, polycultural systems right where people live? So that's combining settlement and agriculture, which always in our historic past were linked together, but in the industrial era have become separated. And so there was a clear connection in starting that with what was happening at the time in what was called back to the land self-sufficiency uh, of people seeking to distance themselves from industrial uh, modernity and uh, do things in simpler ways. But to do that, not just in a return to the past, but using the best of ecological knowledge to uh, better design systems. Now, of course, the efforts to do that by individuals are attempting to tackle a very large you know, scale problem. And, of course, those efforts have you know, been you know, a varying uh, success. I suppose at the other scale, the re-ruralisation of urban areas with food production has been central to the permaculture agenda. So urban agriculture, uh, community gardens, all of those sort of strategies of bring food production back to where people live have been uh, equally important to the, if you like, the transformation of the countryside. So early on in that that recent description you made, you had a beautiful phrase, imagined efficiency of agriculture. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by imagined efficiency? Yes, well, the broad strategy of industrialization of agriculture, which, by the way, was the last thing we managed to industrialize. The first thing that we managed to industrialize was textile production, and there were amazing efficiencies in that over cottage industry versions. Of course, it depended on uh, depletion of, um, uh, you know, then abundant um, fossil resources and um, economic systems that were incredibly um, extractive of, of people, uh, if not straight slavery. But the those efficiencies in textile production were huge. The efficiencies in changing industrialising agriculture were extremely difficult and were late in the piece. They really mostly happened in the um, <clears throat> in the 20th century and especially after the Second World War with high degrees of mechanisation, uh, use of artificial fertilisers, which simplified the soil ecology back to just a, a, a substrate for holding nutrients and 
also by simplifying the, the landscape with larger fields of crops where once you had herbicides, you could almost completely eliminate unwanted plants, um, which farmers historically had always struggled to eliminate from their fields. So you're then virtually eliminating all the biodiversity from a crop and you're getting a higher yield of just that crop. But in terms of other beneficial plants or benefits for humans living in the landscape, you're losing all those. Now, the classic example was in Europe with the elimination of the hedgerow systems that provided a lot of uh, berries and nuts and wild foods, as well as a whole lot of ecosystem services, benefits in stabilising the landscape and, of course, its aesthetic beauty, uh, shelter. All of those were removed to get a larger field that a bigger machine could travel across faster to produce more tonnage of one strain of one crop. And then often not even doing the traditional rotation, but growing that crop year after year. Um, so the degradation of the environment, of course, is, is sort of an obvious outcome of that. But it's also removing from the landscape all of the supplementary foods and nutritional elements that once sustained traditional people. You know, so it's preferencing the one thing that is being sold into the market and discounting all of the things that provided for human needs through the non-monetary economy. I mean, a more recent example is in Asia where the um, vitamin A deficiency of people just dependent on eating rice and not having much else to eat has led to bizarre ideas of genetic engineering, you know, vitamin A in in rice. But what people used to get all of that nutritional supplement from was things that we would call weeds, salads and greens effectively picked in the fields and on the fringes of, of the fields. So once you achieve this imagined efficiency, you've actually lost a whole lot of uh, other things. I mean, other examples um, uh, of the loss of common forest where people used to harvest um, uh, fodder for animals, uh, fuel, uh, used to, in fact, harvest soil compost for their gardens, uh, mushrooms, medicinal plants, those commons being converted into short rotation, monocultural um, timber plantations for pulpwood sold um, through global corporations, effectively pulled all the complex diversity out of those systems. So a lot of those claims of development and improvement that agriculture has had have obviously had big environmental costs, but have also directly reduced productivity that the monetary economy wasn't um, considering. Yeah, um, I used to be a commercial beekeeper, and a fairly common phrase, at least at the time, this is 30 years ago, a fairly common phrase at the time among beekeepers was that uh, you get 90% of your honey from 10% of the land. And what they meant by that was that uh, most of your honey came from the fence rows where nobody nobody mowed and the flowers were allowed to you know continue to bloom and so i'm just i'm just saying that in terms of, of what you're saying about hedgerows that that there were that that's lost as you make the field bigger that's um even excluding non-humans that's uh that's additional honey yeah well honey and bee beekeeping uh, are almost emblematic of the failures of industrial agriculture. Uh, honey was one of the few products that industrialization didn't really, in most places, manage to increase the production of through the addition of fertilizers and fossil fuels that tended to reduce it. 
And, uh, of course, we have a, as you I'm sure well know, as an ex-beekeeper, um, this global crisis with um, bees at, at, at so many levels that is, yeah, very emblematic of those lost benefits and productivities that occurred from uh, a rich um, polycultural landscape. Yeah, there's there's the, the history, the, the recent history of beekeeping is pretty horrifying, that there was a collapse of bees in the um, late 40s and early 50s uh, when pesticides came really came roaring out. And then um, I'm an ex-beekeeper because of the collapse of bees in the 90s. And then, of course, there have been further collapses since. Um, and those collapses are um, not only pesticides, but also having to do with uh, uh, really high mobility. Um, that's a tremendous way to transfer disease. Uh, so you can have beekeepers who will have bees in California in the winter, and then they move them up to the Dakotas in the summer, and other beekeepers who have them in the Dakotas in the summer and in Florida in the winter. So within one calendar year, you can have a disease across the entire country because of mobility and mobility that shouldn't be there. I mean, bees should not spend their winters in California and their summers in South Dakota. Yes, well, we have here at Meliodora in the central highlands of Victoria. Of course, Australia is still the only country without uh, varroa and also uh, the varroa mite and also a landscape here relatively uh, less toxic than in America, largely due because there have never been agricultural subsidies here. So there's actually less incentive for use of uh, pesticides. Um, and, of course, Australia still has a huge diversity of floral sources, especially in its eucalypt flora. And we have uh, 15 hives on this site, which are, of course, sedentary, uh, permanent in the one location. Um, but, of course, those same issues uh, that are globally very strong are, of course, coming to Australia as well. But in some ways, I, I feel we live in a, uh, a bee paradise at the moment. <laughs> so one of the... Th- it seems that one of the very uh, revolutionary and, um, I can't think of the other word now, um, aspects of permaculture is that you are challenging the whole question of economies of scale. And can you first talk theoretically about about that? You have quite a bit already, but can you talk a little bit more about it? And then also can you talk about practically and there, okay I live in Northern California and marijuana is of course one of the major crops of Northern California and with legalization of marijuana I have seen because that allows increased economies of scale I have seen the destruction of entire communities economies faced with the overpowering strength of that as Instead of it being artisanal or artisanal, um, it has been now you can have you know entire city blocks converted to greenhouses, which 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 pushes economically pushes. So I guess I guess what I'm really getting at is can you talk about the what permaculture says about the the whole capitalist economy and also what it says and also what what that means in practical terms for permaculture? Do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah. So, firstly, at the theoretical level, the economies of scale are economies of fossil fuel uh, scale, um, as opposed to human scale. So, once we tapped the massive reserves of ancient stored sunlight in fossil fuel, it gradually maximum power out of human systems was achieved by doing things in more centralised, concentrated ways. The power that sustained that came out of holes in the ground at specific places rather than the energy being distributed across the landscape in the form of sunshine, rain and soil fertility. 
So that concentration of energetic power, totally real organized human systems around that, which of course also human settlement, the mass urbanization. So I don't think those changes that, that capitalism uh, has been associated with are primarily products of capitalist ideology, but primarily a product of energetic density uh, that is actually driving human systems. So in that sense, I'm coming from a perspective and permaculture was informed by a perspective which is uh, looking at energetics and ecology as the most powerful organising forces that shape human systems. And uh, often when historians step back far enough, it's those sort of ecological and energetic factors that are seen as the great shaping things rather than ideological ones. So that organisation clearly had downsides for nature and downsides for humans because we are not at that scale in our inherent being Um, and all sorts of stresses and alienations and impacts. But those for a long time, those downsides could be compensated for with um, interventionist medicine, centralised food distribution systems that brought a diversity of food from um, across whole regions and then across the globe, uh, through social welfare structures to replace the sort of self-organising uh, help that existed in uh, pre-industrial communities. And you, you could keep ahead of the, the problems if you like, as industrial systems reach their fundamental limits, the backwash of all those problems is coming back uh, onto us. But it's still true that the the market system through the the power of um, capitalism takes everything that looks like it's successful in some basic energetic way or due to particular aberrations of economies like uh, illegality or high, incredibly high value of a, a plant, um, marijuana, that's actually a very simple and easy plant to grow. Uh, and so there's no reason why it should have a particularly high value. And then use all of those other resources like you were saying, greenhouses and larger scale, to suddenly achieve the, if you like, optimum fossil fuel capitalism um, debt finance uh, scale of things. And that always seems to grow to larger and larger economies of scale. So we can see that in world manufacturing at the moment where making Motor cars is is virtually becoming uneconomic, and the solution to that is for the the corporations to progressively eat each other and amalgamate towards a pattern of eventually sort of like one global manufacturer. Uh, and we can see that with airlines and others, where there's this capitalism tends to deal with these problems by larger and larger aggregation. Um, we, we can also see that even without the collapse of the fossil fuel base, um, that sometimes opens opportunities at the bottom, the vacuum for micro businesses to move in. And we saw that with the industrialization of um, beer making um, eventually led to opportunities for uh, micro breweries, which then of course became reabsorbed into the capitalist system. But we can see those patterns repeating themselves, but we know in an energy descent future, it makes no sense to have large centralized breweries and it makes common sense to have localized small scale, uh, ones again. But 
the modelling of those small scale systems which permaculture is attempting to do is often working against the tide of economic forces which still are putting a signal in saying big is better, <laughs> big is more successful. So I think that's a, a dynamic that's playing out, but um, and it's a huge historic uh, transformations we're talking about. But what, when we're right in the middle of it, uh, yeah, we still see these forces by which capitalism tends to aggregate everything up to larger scales, and especially with the use of uh, debt financing of very cheap money to immediately throw resources at something and do something not just big, but very fast. We see this in the development sector with residential development and in places like Australia, where I am uh, insane property bubble economics, where developers are developing housing estates in the fastest possible time with the most finance and, of course, made possible by fossil fuel machinery and technology. And then they're selling that into a market in the hope they can sell it all before the market value collapses. (laughs) And then if they get all that money, they then do another one as fast as possible so that so many of the uh, economic processes that are happening, there's a constant driving fear that this will not be sustained or this, or somehow the, the economic um, viability will move to something else or somewhere else or um, rather than it being a, a slower, more sustained process of uh, uh, local economies. So permaculture is part of one of the many ideas uh, and movements in the world that are contributing to a, a relocalization of how we model a relocalization of economies and how we do that not so much through policy change or uh, those sorts of ideas but more directly through uh, living uh, the the model of of how we see that. And uh, I think there's some interesting examples that small-scale production of vegetables at the garden home scale is already showing that the so-called economies of scale of industrial production are actually breaking down and that it does actually make sense to produce perishable food close to where people are consuming it. And, of course, there's all sorts of compromises in that because it still represents, if you like, a luxury commodity into affluent people who want organic food. But we see these cycles of learning that are been happening over the last 40 years where while having to deal with the the capitalist affluent economy, people are still developing uh, methods that start to model um, the way we will need live in the future. Of course, the most radical examples of that are not in the monetary economy. As I said, they're in the household economy where we still have the choice that we can do whatever we like to a fair extent. We can choose to do things um, in in different ways and we don't have to comply with a whole lot of rules and regulations. So we can, you know, compost our own human waste and safely recycle it back into food production where we live. We can we can have different standards about what we think is um, how we behave uh, and we can do so many things that it's still not possible to do in the monetary economy. So that's why a lot of my work in permaculture is very strongly focused on strengthening that um, household uh, level action, which 
uh, my more recent work in, in permaculture called Retro Suburbia is focused at that level. Can you talk a, a little bit about some of the examples you mentioned? You said there are really good examples of people going against the sort of economies of scale. Can you can you give a couple examples of that? Yeah, well, I suppose um, the developments in uh, what's called you know biointensive methods of organic cultivation, which a lot of people would see, oh, that's not permaculture because it's things in rows or. Um, because it's it's mostly annual plants rather than um, forest gardens, but it is producing the perishable vegetable products that people actually largely consume. And of course, that process of redesigning what we consume is a as big a project as the process of how we produce those things. And and so there's issues there in terms of we do have to produce more or less what people are going to eat. And so those highly bred vegetables um, that grown in highly fertile, uh, compost-enriched uh, soil, we know that production um, uh, can be at yield rates which are higher than from broadacre uh, field agriculture. Of course, um, in California, the work of John Jevons going back many decades uh, has um, not just shown that to be the case in theory, but there's a lot of small-scale growers who are uh, doing that and bringing product to market from very small production systems, diversity of products often sold through uh, community-supported agriculture, uh, which has the demand on the producer to produce a diversity. So while market systems tend to force growers in towards monoculture, becoming specialists at one thing, and then the market provides the diversity out through distribution systems, community-supported agriculture, where people are getting a seasonal box of vegetables, the customers, of course, want diversity in the box, which is quite challenging for producers because that that requires that high skill level. So people who can do that on a small scale, on sites that are close to the producers, are you know, often economically viable. And probably the extreme of that would be uh, Curtis Stone um, in your sort of broad region of the world, but further north, who's um, been a model for many people producing in quarter acre residential blocks that you know doesn't own but just leases and is growing vegetables on these tiny patches and supplying direct um, to customers and uh, uh, restaurants so that's one example of a lineage of work which has come out of um, not exclusively from permaculture, but influenced by permaculture and other related ideas and techniques to refine those techniques to the extent that they can work within, um, you know, the current monetary economy with those, those different models such as uh, community supported agriculture. So I recognize that this next question is, is unfair because I'm presuming that the answer is going to be all of the above. But is permaculture primarily set up as a – not set up, but is it is it conceptualized as a challenge to the industrial system or as a temporary adjunct uh, to the industrial system, as a model against the industrial system, or a safety net for as the industrial system collapses, or, as I said, all of the above? Yeah, there's definitely uh, an element of uh, all of those, and different people have uh, um, taken it in in different ways, em- emphasising you know different aspects uh, of that. Um, certainly, a lot of people um, have been motivated by it being the safe net net um, uh, for some sort of dramatic. Um, and 
imminent collapse and that motivated a lot of people in uh, Australia in the late 70s with the early enthusiasm of, of permaculture in the Back to the Land movement um, and in the 80s. And, of course, that sort of uh, imminent collapse didn't happen. So the, <laughs> there's other motivations as well. Other Other people have taken it as an inspiration to then how to adapt and compromise of how one lives within the industrial uh, capitalist system and in some way maintain some ethics and values of a system that might evolve in the shadow of uh, that system as it declines. Uh, so the idea of developing a, a parallel uh, economy. Um, and I think there's also an element of uh, direct opposition, which has not been so strongly emphasised because um, permaculture never had a, a, a specific, um, you know, political agenda, but the idea of actually being more self-reliant, um, disconnecting from the market system is not just um, an ethical and value statement, but when it's done by people who are part of the global middle class and they withdraw not just their consumption, but their high value work as from well-educated people not contributing as much to the system and then taking what financial and other wealth they have and effectively reinvesting it outside of that system, then that represents a sort of a triple strike uh, compared with the early industrial workers who could only withdraw their labour. Their consumption didn't really amount to a lot, um, and they certainly their investment they didn't really have any assets, whereas modern middle class people, even relatively small numbers, I've argued, uh, withdrawing their support as they build these parallel systems is a very powerful signal uh, of contraction. And, of course, um, modern capitalist systems don't just need to retain the majority of a shrinking market, they need to grow all the time. And so that signal has the potential to be very politically powerful, I've argued in, in some of my more recent essays. So I've suggested that the simple strategies of what appear to be self-reliance and ethical withdrawal from those industrial systems um, may have more agency in uh, change than it appears. Uh, and certainly people have sometimes joked that that um, permaculture is revolution disguised as gardening. Um, so it doesn't necessarily start from a framework of um, of everyone needing to agree that the, uh, the current systems of human, human uh, organisation and economy are unethical and unsustainable and, and need to be removed, uh, but it can lead to that uh, view by living part of, uh, a part alternative to that and, and then through those actions can be a potentially effective strategy that people can engage in to contribute to bringing about that change. So recognizing that permaculture is as varied as the land bases to, to land bases where it's applied, um, how has both your thinking and permaculture in general changed, evolved since the late 70s? What are some of the, the key points that your thinking and and permaculture in general have have 
What are some of the ways it's transformed in the last 40 years? Yeah, well, I, I think uh, one change that many people would identify that was sort of signaled fairly early on, but that the permanent um, agriculture was, of course, what uh, the word permaculture came from, but implicit in that was also permanent culture. And so that gradual increase of focus from the land to people, um, and a lot of that would be seen at uh, the, you know, the redesign of, of, of how we live and relate to each other, um, as well as the redesign of the land, a lot of people would identify that as a, as a large shift. And I think there's also been part of the lineage of permaculture, especially through um, the leading work of my co-originator, Bill Mollison, in projecting permaculture out around the world, uh, a strong uh, sort of warrior, uh, masculinist sort of approach to redesign of the physical world to an increasing focus on uh, perhaps a more inwardly looking uh, uh, feminine redesign of ourselves uh, focus. And some of that has been a sort of a, a gender shift, and an observation that early on uh, permaculture seemed to be dominated by uh, men and um, uh you know, that shift that there's been in, in permaculture uh, globally. Um, uh, so that's obviously a very sort of complex and, and nuanced one, but it, it happens also very practically. So like where we live here in central Victoria, we uh, produce most of our own food, and some of that's because of uh, good permaculture design and and hard work, but some of it is also because we eat what we produce. We've changed uh, who we are, you know, through the environment changing us. So that often you get to a point where projecting outwards to change the the physical world um, is a game that you know has limits. <laughs> And it's easier to actually change internally, um, change what we value, change what we do. So um, that balance is one that just comes from doing this stuff anyway. Um, and uh, so that's one change. Um, I think uh, another change has been um, the recognition that the original vision of humans getting a lot more of their food from uh, perennials and especially trees is actually a long-term evolutionary project and that the success in making that transformation has been very, very modest and permaculture's contribution to it has actually been modest, but it has stimulated a whole slow-moving work in uh, research, some of it really that will need to go on over generations of selecting and breeding nuts and uh, other tree crops uh, to provide for human needs. And it's interesting that that ties into that first issue I was talking about of changing uh, who we are, because a lot of what we eat is actually deep uh, sort of cultural stuff about what people regard as appropriate food, and that often shifts only uh, slowly. Um, I think there's been also huge changes as permaculture has gone out around the world to different places not only the environment being different, but the cultural context. 
and a huge amount of permaculture activism has been in places like where you live and where I live in uh, the most affluent uh, parts of the world. Uh, but there's a whole lot of permaculture work that has been working uh, with the most disadvantaged people um, at the extreme in places like refugee camps, but also where people are traditionally in place but in environments which for various reasons are very degraded and the carrying capacity to support people is very limited. So in those places, I'd use the example of, of the sort of cool uh, permaculture technique of a living fence where you plant spiky or other uh, vigorous plants in a physical barrier to provide a, a fence to keep animals out of a garden, for example. Well, if you or I to, to try that where we live, um, you know, it's actually quite complicated and it's hard work and it needs a lot of maintenance and it's easier to um, go down to the uh, local tip and get some old galvanised wire if not buy it from the, the hardware because it's not that expensive for most people with their salaries and make a fence, um, you know, with the industrial <laughs> uh, solution. Whereas in some places in Africa where people have no capacity in a village to sort of grow anything around their houses because animals range everywhere, the introduction of a new species of plant that can uh, create living fences may be a transformative technology that enables people to add something to their traditional system that they weren't able to do before. So when working in those very different contexts, permaculture really obviously means, you know, completely different things in, in, in those, uh, uh, those different um, uh, you know, cultural and, and uh, economic contexts. You were mentioning about the the, the food tree um, idea, and I just wanted to mention to you that I was talking with a couple of uh, friends the other day who live in uh, Kentucky in the U.S., and one of their big things is that in the community where they live, they are... Um, when a shade tree uh, dies on the street, um, they're replacing them with fruit trees and nut trees. And that has been very successful over the last, you know, 15, 20 years. So, so mm. um, that's just validation of one way that that, uh, that that notion is being spread. If you're going to have a, a, a tree, you may as well be able to eat from it. And that's what happens is everybody just... Um, you know, as they walk by, if it's in season, then they then they grab a, a fruit or some nuts. Yeah, and I think that, uh, at least symbolically, has been one of the ways in which permaculture ideas have impacted into our existing urban environments. The idea that our, our public spaces should be food producing in that casual way and be part of the, the commons of course, there's all sorts of practical reasons that led to the elimination of food from those spaces and, you know, the claim that the fruit falling on the pavement is messy and, um, you know, sometimes carries pests because the trees are unmanaged, unharvested. So those problems that came about in affluent modern times were because people weren't using uh, those uh, those plants um, and permaculture was in the early days part of the pushback against that preferencing of ornamental horticulture in our uh, habitats as being something that's actually quite dysfunctional and it wasn't really that Mollison and Holmgren hated roses or <laughs> lawns specifically but that those things were a sort of a cultural statement of initially the English middle class copying the English aristocracy who transformed their own rural estates uh, from having messy little tenement farmers everywhere, got rid of all those and had landscape architects like Capability Brown and others design great sweeping pastoral estates that they could look out on from their house. 
because they had other sources of wealth, effectively the industrial sources of wealth, and they didn't need the productivity of the tenement farmers. And then the English middle class copied that with a lawn and ornamental garden in in the front garden as a statement, a, a social statement, that they were people of means. They didn't need to produce food. So we saw that that suburban culture of ornamentation, um, uh, a dysfunctional um, relationship to nature, and we wanted to attack that directly by saying, grow some vegetables in the front garden and plant a fruit tree on the on the street. Uh, and so that idea has certainly permaculture was one of the sources for that that idea spreading around the affluent world that food is an appropriate thing to to have rather than something to be hidden away um, in the, uh, the private space of the backyard. Uh, so, you know, there is a significant cultural statement uh, going on there. And we see it everywhere in the world where um, Western affluence has spread people start hiding their production because that is a sign of one being a peasant still with one's, you know, dirt under one's fingernails. And, you know, to reverse that process and celebrate that is um, an important cultural statement, but, of course, a, a very practical one. And that that relates to also what I was saying about that deep research that's needed to trial many sort of unknown or poorly known species, one of the ways we can do that is not in research stations, but actually in our lived landscapes to actually use these plants broadly and then through that process over generations, elite um, trees uh, that will have um, genetic material that's superior can be selected uh, through that process of them being a common and abundant part of our landscapes. So we have like a minute or two left, and um, two possible directions you can choose one or both. That one of them is so. What would you? What one concept would you like people to take away from this interview? And the other one is if somebody lives in Nova Scotia or Mississippi or Portugal and they're interested in permaculture but they don't know much about it, what can they do and what can how can they learn more and what can they how can they put it into their lives? Yes, well taking that second one which is extremely <laughs> difficult because of course it's hard to give a, a message which is um, uh, globally relevant. Exactly. I I will say something um Briefly about my latest work, um, the book Retro Suburbia, A Downshifter's Guide to a Resilient Future. It's a, a book that distills how this thinking over the last 40 years has expressed itself in the landscapes where most Australians live and also an increasing number of the, the world, certainly global li- middle class, live in some sort of pattern of uh, separate houses on residential blocks that we would broadly call suburbia, whether that's in the in the vast territories surrounding our large cities or uh, in smaller regional towns or even villages like where I live. That pattern of housing and settlement is incredibly com- uh, common and that it's often been seen as a uh, uh, a problem as being unsustainable, and I've argued that it's one of the most amenable environments to retrofit using permaculture design thinking uh, to retrofit both the built environment, the biological, how we produce food, and the behavioural within the household uh, economy, and that's spreading out into the neighbourhood and community economy. So... In that book, I've distilled it as a a pattern language within those three fields of retrofitting. And retrofitting is important rather than 
uh, greens um, fields design because almost everywhere people are dealing with something that already exists. Whereas a lot of permaculture design has focused on the blank slate, the start from scratch type of um, uh, design. And retrofitting is also uh, very relevant because it's incremental and uh, rather than the grand plan at the start, we look at what we have and how it can be tweaked. So it has something that is more amenable to a learning cycle where we can make small mistakes and we are already dealing with uh, something that we uh, have. Now, that book is written the exact opposite of all the intentions of publishing to have something that's globally relevant. It's written for southeastern Australia, for the territory in which I live. But the broad patterns are relevant in so many different places where people across the world live in those forms and settlements. And people are now um, uh, wanting to even translate the book into other languages. And I'm, I'm saying, well, the well, language translation is one thing, but there's a, a sort of a cultural context translation too. And for people who understand permaculture thinking, um, they're certainly seeing that as an energising, uh, a stronger relevance to ordinary people and what people can do and breaking that perception that permaculture is for people who have large areas of land or must be um, owners of land um, and that it being primarily a rural um, thing. So in some ways it's actually returning to the roots of permaculture as a movement which started in the suburbs of Melbourne in the late 70s uh, and there was a, a sort of a huge interest in those early days at with things like street trees and front vegetable gardens and retrofitting houses to make them uh, energy efficient. So I think those uh, ideas and uh, related ideas of, of how we adapt to where we are um, are maybe one of the one of the emerging ways in which uh, uh, permaculture is contributing. Well, thank you so much for that, and thank you so much for your work in the world, and I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been David Holmgren. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.